Okay, now I wasn't really sure what noises made last time, but I think I'll be able to do it right this time. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a new product announcement video for this 1-6 scale US D90-045-3050 cradle set. This cradle set is a new addition to the EastCoastArmory.com product line and this particular example that's seen here on video is a pre-production set that I went ahead and built up to this configuration to double check to see if there are any sort of tweaks or fine tuning that needs to be made to the set. We'll be going over the cradle mount in this video, as well as also I'm going to briefly touch upon the assembly of both the cradle as well as the M2 that you see in this video. This setup that you see here is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. With the configuration that we have the model here, this is really more or less intended for a vehicle mounted roll, which is why it's mounted on the pedestal base that we have here. However, although this is intended for a vehicle type application, this unit here will never be mounted on a vehicle and it's going to be kept in this format primarily to be used as a display piece. However, that doesn't mean that the setup here is useless for any other type of application. This setup can also be used for a static emplacement type diorama or some kind of a pillbox or a foxhole type setup. Just like I stated in another 1-6 scale cradle video, both the cradle as well as the pedestal base are sold separately on the ECA catalog. The components are also made out of two different types of media. The cradle itself is made from 3D printed components, while the pedestal base is comprised out of cast resin pieces. Also, like I mentioned in the other video, the only thing that's offered on the ECA catalog are the cradle and the pedestal base. The main armament as well as the ammo can that you see in this video are not supplied with either of the sets, nor are they something that are offered on the ECA catalog. Just like with all the other cradles that are offered on ECA, the set that you see here is specifically intended for use with the Dragon M2HB. In my opinion, of all the options out there in 1-6 scale, the Dragon rendition is the most accurate and is the best option available. Even though Dragon themselves don't really produce this unit anymore, there is a clone of the Dragon set that is readily available at the moment and can be found on various online retailers. Another option that's currently found on the 1-6 scale marketplace is the unit from 21st Century Toys. However, I have never tested one of those units on the ECA cradle, so I can't say whether or whether or not it will be able to be fitted to the setup that we have here. And here are the cradle components at the start of the assembly. What you see on the table consists of the components to assemble the ammunition can tray, as well as the main yoke assembly itself. What is absent on the table, but what is included with the ECA sets, are some lengths of plastic rods, a length of chain, as well as also some lengths of metal wire. Obviously, all of those are necessary in order to get the unit fully assembled. Starting with the top runner, this consists of all the components to assemble the main tray. This set here is basically identical to the one that was seen on the previous ECA cradle review video, only this one here has been improved from that variant. As I stated in the other one, the other component was more or less a pre-production sample and after my experiences with assembling and seeing that one in the flesh, I went ahead and saw some areas to improve upon and those corrections have been made to this unit. Also, I want to point out that the same improvements were made to the production ammo can runner that is present with that set. Here you get to see what the pieces look like while still on their sprues. We have here the three components that are used to assemble that intricate articulating arm belt holder device that I touched upon in the other video. And obviously this here is the main ammo can holder itself. The second runner consists of the main yolk. Now, unlike the other mount where the ammo can mount assembly was a separate piece that plugs into place, for this mount here, it 
a slightly different format and the piece is all one integral printing. This is very similar along the lines of the real unit as this unit was straight up welded to the side of the of the receiver mount. And with the way the unit is designed, you don't have to have this as a separate piece because of all these cutouts here to get access to the main pivoting fasteners. But we'll touch upon that as the video progresses. Here you get to see the main yoke itself. Note the detailing found on this part as well as all the little eyelets for the chain, which undoubtedly I'm going to be touching upon as the video goes on. But you can also see all of the little support ribs, as well as the sculpted, or I should say, the integrally printed weld beads that are present on all of these locations. And the same is also true for this piece itself. The runner, in addition to consisting of the yolk and the receiver components, also have printed on the two connecting fasteners which are used to pin everything in place and will allow the piece to hinge once it's fully assembled. And that's basically it. So from here I'm going to go ahead and snip these pieces off, get them assembled, and then really just get it, the thing ready for painting. And after a little bit of work on the pedestal, the unit now is fully assembled and is ready for painting. At the moment you can see I have an M19 19A4 just dropped into place just as a placeholder but as you can see the M1919 goes into the other locations namely right here for the rear takedown pin. Pay no attention to this nail over here that's just being used as a placeholder for the time being but if I was going to mount this into the cradle for real the proper pin would fit in place. If I pop the pins out 1919 gets removed and if I want to rig it for the M2, here I have my fully assembled and ready for painting M2HB. And I just drop it directly where it needs to go. And again, after it's painted, the, the proper pins will be utilized. But there you go. As you can see, it just fits in without any sort of problems or any other sort of difficulties. And from here, I could go ahead and progress with the rest of the paint. One thing that I didn't touch upon in the last video is exactly what does this setup look like prior to paint because you know I showed it fully painted and weathered and you get an idea of what it looks like once done but I figured let's go ahead and show this unit prior to painting. With the M2 removed and also with the cradle mount removed here we have the pedestal base. Like I said before this pedestal is an old precasted unit that I had for many years now. This one is an off casting from one of the production units and rather than having it sit in my shop just bouncing around I might as well go ahead and build it up. One thing I also mentioned in the other video I do plan on phasing these out so these are on their way to retirement. I just figured after I burn through my stash of them which is about two more at this point two or three more then this piece here can be put out the pasture and I can go ahead and redesign it in CAD. The piece, like I said before, is probably one of the oldest items that are still in production and offered on the catalog for the time being. This one here was casted back in, oof, by the color of the rest, and I want to say 2007 or so. So it's been in the stash, or not in the stash, but in my spare resting bin for a very, very long time. Note the Resting at the time I was using was this ivory color. Well, it's turned more yellow over the years, but back in the day I did used to use an ivory type colored resin until I switched in about 10 years ago to the gray material that has been seen on all the other ECA cast items really ever since. But it's interesting to see a mix of fresh cast and old casted parts all lumped together here. Also, like I touched upon in the other video, with the way the kit is currently on the website, you do not have the provisions for the lock bar, the lock bar retainer, or the tripod legs. The, these components need to be scratchable by the builder. And for the legs here, these are actually two sections of Plastruct angle. I believe this is quarter inch angle. And you snip them to the lengths, you glue the two halves together which will give you the T-shape that we have right here. The pieces are fastened in place with small brass micro fasteners. I believe these are 256 and then sculpted wall beads were added just to complete the look. So that's really all there is to this. Of course this is the travel lock and this can pivot upward and lock into the recess found on the rear portion of the cradle that I'll touch upon later. But 
yeah, these pieces, even though they are old, they still polish up pretty well, and I have used these on Jeeps in the past, so they are they are workable. Uh, but again, you know, they are showing their age, and I, it is something that I do want to eventually phase out, possibly within the next few months or so. But, you know, it's good to see one of the older items being used. For the cradle itself, this is what it looks like now fully assembled. At this point here, it is ready for paint. The arm mechanism is full function, and the tray is also fully removable. And by the way, this does not get glued on. This just gets slid into place as it does on the real unit. The elevation works. Of course, there is the locking bar, which I will touch upon later, along with the travel lock hookup right there towards the tail. On the arm itself, you can see the little spring details. And this is what they look like once all bent to their appropriate shape. If anyone's not used to bending these springs, it takes a little bit of getting used to, but once you figure it out, you can just, you know, run off a few of them. There goes the pintle section. Obviously, this plugs directly into place, like so. And once in place, it doesn't move around. It's nice and stiff. For the M2, on this one here, this is actually my resting cast M2. This is not something that I sell at all on the catalog. This is actually a copy of the Dragon injection molded kit. And the reason why I went ahead and made some copies of the Dragon part is because if you build as many American tanks as I do in 1.6 scale, you tend to need a lot of M2 HBs. And so rather than just keep on hunting down Dragon sets that have the tripod and the ammo can that aren't really useful, I went ahead and decided to just make a copy of my own to use on my own personal build, and really that's the only time you'll see these units being used. If I'm doing a build for commission or something, I will use a aftermarket set from another manufacturer. But for my own personal needs, you know, I have enough M2s, you know, basically to last from here to infinity. The P, since it is the Dragon one, it does cock. The feed tray does open up like I showed before. Although being cast in resin, it's a little bit more fragile compared to the injection molder counterpart from the original Dragon kit. But as you can see here, as or specifically as I showed before, the cradle is Dragon spec, so the unit will drop directly into place. Same is also true for that other M2 that's on, that is on the market. I don't know the name of it offhand, but in case anyone's wondering, that M2 is basically a copy of the Dragon M2, but just done in injection mold of plastic, and which is great because if you're looking for a nice M2 1.6 scale for a vehicle or just any general use, the Dragon M2, in my opinion, was the best one. It's on top of the food chain, along with the one from 21st Century, and I believe Hasbro had a good one too. Uh, you know, that actually should be a whole video in itself. 1.6 scale M2s and ring from good to bad, and believe it or not, there are some bad ones out there, and I am talking about even the metal ones, so... That should be a topic for another video. Um, what else to talk about? Oh, on this one here, obviously I had to fabricate my own little barrel handle. Just wire bent to the appropriate shape. I have here the small little tube on the inside as what's found on these things. And yeah, that's basically it. The peep sight is drilled out. It's hard to get on camera, but you can see it right over there. I do the same mod on the Dragon ones. And the ladder sight is fully functional. Of course, with the M2, when you raise up, it's a ladder sight. And when it folds down, it is a peep sight. That's really all there is to it. So, from here, I'm going to go ahead and get all these components into paint. So, here are all the components broken down to their main sub-assemblies. And at this point here, they're going through their painting process. For how to paint them, I go into great detail about this in a tutorial video that I posted about a year ago. Only rather than being an M2, it was a Armor Packs 1.6 scale M1919A4. However, even though the models are different, the weathering and painting techniques are all identical. But I do want to briefly touch upon the type of paints that were used. For the M2, I went ahead and painted it with the Rust-Oleum Dark Gray Primer that we have right here. I've used this color on a number of my 1.6 scale MGs in the past because this color does a really good job with giving you the look of parkerization. And if I bring the M2 up to the camera, you can really see and get this in better light. You can also use just straight up flat black spray paint. The color is a little bit different, but this is not inaccurate. During the war, there were several M2s that were 
blued in coloring compared to the parkerization look that we see on this one here. As for which one to go with, well, really this depends on your own personal choice and preference. For the can holder, this was painted with Rust-Oleum Forest Green. It's like an olive drab type spray paint they sell for hunting camouflage, but the color itself is pretty good and I've actually used it on numerous occasions. The remainder of the parts, namely the rest of the cradle and the pedestal base are currently spray painted in flat black because this acts as a primer for me to add the acrylics and the latex paints over it that are going to be the final shades of one shape or form of olive drab or another. For the primer, I went and used this can here of flat black spray paint, which is the Lowe's brand. Uh, this is something I do want to mention because when I ran out of spray paints, I usually restock with the Home Depot brand, but uh, during October, it was almost impossible to find any in stock. I guess every Karen on this side of the Mississippi were buying them to do some crafting for Halloween, I guess. So because of that, uh, black, flat black spray paint was actually pretty hard to come by. So I found a, sh a stockpile of them in Lowe's, which is this brand that we have here. And I gotta say that it's not nearly as good as the Home Depot stuff. I know it's just spray paint and spray paint, but you know, there are some differences. This stuff I noticed tends to be a little bit thinner and runnier compared to the stuff from Home Depot, which is fine, it's, it's workable, but this all this means is that you're going to need to go through several more layers as opposed to the Home Depot one, where in the Home Depot one, you could get it done in like two or three coats, while this one here might take about four or five. Uh, I have about six left, so I'm gonna use them all up, and once I'm done with them, hopefully I'll never need to get these again. But so far, to be fair, the stuff has been working for me, and I use it on several 135s, and, and several 1.6 scales, and even some 116s. So I've been using it on all my builds, and it has been working pretty well for me. It's just I prefer the Home Depot stuff. It's a little bit better quality. Uh, one thing to mention is that on spray paints that have this general shape. Walmart has them too. It's a different brand, but the can looks identical with the same type of cap on it. You might want to be cautious of those because I think it might be the same supplier because I think I ran into the same issue on those spray paints too. So, you know, if the, if it has a traditional spray paint top like this one here, I think it's a little bit better of a formula compared to this one. But again, I have used this one to great length on builds that I've been working on recently. So keep that in mind. Back to the parts that we have here, both the cradle and the pedestal base are going to be painted with two different types of olive drab. In case anyone is wondering, yes, the can holder and the cradle are going to be two separate shades and they are going to be different from one another. I'm doing this on purpose. If anyone have ever been around these things or seen them in real life, on many occasions you'll note that the can holders might not necessarily match the paint and coloring that are on the remainder of the cradle. And by doing this type of effect, it's a way to give a little bit extra interest to your builds. Now this one here is again just being built as an example, but again, you know, this technique might come in handy if you're doing a 1.6 scale or a 1.16, hell, even a 135. It's just a way to add a little bit extra flavor to your builds. And it's one of those things that really not a whole lot of people even think about. Both the pedestal and the cradle are going to be airbrushed with the base color and then I could go over with the weathering once everything is dry. This fellow over here could probably use a extra coat here or there because I see some blank areas underneath the handle and some other smaller crevices, but I'll go ahead and take care of that right away. The M2, at this point, he's actually ready for weathering and I could continue then with painting the handles and all the other little fine details that generally get painted on these type of things. So with the cradle, the box holder, and the M2 all painted, they're gonna slide off into weathering and completion. But before I do, the one thing I do wanna to touch upon are the securing pins. And these are actually pretty important because obviously it's what holds everything together. The two shorter pins here are going to be used to pin the M2 to the cradle, while the longer pin is the travel lock pin, and that's what's used to go into this little hole right over here. When it comes to these pins, there are actually a whole subgenre in the pins themselves, but I'm not going to touch upon that in this video. It's too expansive. But generally, the pins have this type of metal clip on them, which is used as a handle so that you can actually yank out the pin. And it's also used to hold the chain retention system that keeps everything nice and tidy right over here. The rods and the wire are supplied with the sets along with the chain, but they are not pre-cut, drilled, or bent to shape. In order to bend the pieces to shape, this is actually fairly easily done with just a simple pair of pliers like this here, and these can be found in any 
uh, craft store, and if you don't have them, one, you shouldn't be building models because these are kind of mandatory for model building, and two, if you don't have one, well, you know, it's time to upgrade your tool game if you want to <laughs> have some decent quality results. Here's the wire that I have here, just thin floor wire. Again, these are supplied. And although I am not going to pre-bend these pieces for each of the orders, that would be just insane, I am going to show how to do it on camera. And I'm probably going to be able to do it in one take because once you get the hang of it, it's actually really easy. All right, so without further ado, here we go. And there we have it. So this just gets snipped off like so. And there's the clip now completed. The pins, I went ahead and drilled them off camera with a pin vise. Uh, let's see, right there. You see the hole, there's just some paint scraped on it from when I was adjusting the size. And in order to secure these in place, all you gotta do, bend these insert into the hole and then secure it. You can also use the plier to adjust the shape because generally when you bend them out of the way to fit in place they get slightly deformed. But you just hand fit each of these and then once you're done the piece will be ready for painting. When stringing the piece up with its chain basically once you have the correct length you open up the piece a little bit you slide the chain in and then it just goes to where it needs to go. If the piece, or I should say if the pin falls out, just obviously repeat the steps that I touched upon before for the mounting. Once the chains are retained in place, the pins are ready for painting. One thing that's unique is that although there are four pins present, there are only two lengths of chain. This is because each of the pins are secured on either end of the length of chain. When it comes for securing the chains to the cradle, this is done at some point in the mid span here of the chain length, and it connects to one of these two eyelets that are found on the cradle. The way this works is that the eyelet ring in the back secures the pins for the rear receiver lock pin, as well as also the pedestal based travel lock bar pin that goes right over here. The eyelet ring in the front secures the front receiver pin, as well as also the pin for the main travel lock. Right now the chain work has been painted and it's currently in dry time and straight out of dry time we have here the pedestal base. So at this point here I am actually ready to continue with the weathering and final completion. So let's go ahead and get started.
With the model now fully completed, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. Currently with the way the model set up, it's in its travel lock mode. What's interesting is that all of the cradles have their own internal built-in travel lock. The travel lock that we see currently configured, however, is a travel lock that is found on the pedestal base itself. In order to disengage from the travel lock, you would pull this pin that we have right here. This pin gets pulled and the unit can then swing downward. Once the travel lock is pivoted downward, it fits into this little recess that we have right over here built into the bottom of the pedestal base. With the unit pivoted out of the way, the M2 can now freely rotate as well as also freely elevate. Now, like I stated before, all US cradles have a travel lock that's built into it. And that is for this pin that we have right over here. If you'll notice on the cradle, there's a second set of lugs right over here, as well as there's a corresponding hole found right here on the yoke. The way it works is that the unit would pivot into this section and then the pin would slide in and once fully installed, it secures the unit in place and it locks it in the upward position that we have here. Obviously, when it comes time for usage, you would pull this out and the unit can then freely pivot and elevate like it was able to do before. Basically, all US cradles have a similar feature on them, be it this unit, the M23, or the other 3050 cradle mount that I mentioned in the other video. Outside of that, there's nothing really much to go over feature-wise. As we saw before, the M2 locks into the cradle via these two pins that we have here and here. If you're going to mount on an M1919, you would simply use this pin in this hole over here, as opposed to the one you see it for the M2 usage. The setup is almost identical in functionality to the other 3050 cow mount that I touched upon before. The big difference though is with the method of fabrication. And to help compare and contrast between the two mounts, here I have none other than the other 3050 mount that I touched upon in the other video. This way you really get to see the differences and the similarities between the two units. First, both of these units were designed by the U.S. during World War II and both saw extensive service with the U.S. military in both World War II and also beyond. Both utilize the same interchangeable ammo can mounting system where you hit this latch and the ammo can holder can be removed and you can replace it with either a different style of ammo can holder as the U.S. had a few different variants during the war, but you can also secure on the 200 round tombstone ammo can if one desires. The other thing that is also radically different between the two is with the way they are produced. This unit here is entirely composing of cast components. This would include the yolk, the cradle, and even that little adapter mechanism that I touched upon before. It's because of this method of construction is why this unit has the distinctive look to it that I just touched upon. Note how everything is just curvy and swoopy and the geometry found on the cradle itself is very, very intricate. In comparison, the other unit is much more simplified because it's made exclusively from metal stampings. The only components that are made from stampings on this one here is the unit that bolts to the casted cradle and this unit is used to hold the track that the ammo can holder slides into. While on this unit, the entire fabrication is done with metal stampings. You can see here with the cradle and the yolk, yolk is just one piece of metal that is bent to shape 
And then to give that added rigidity, we have braces that are welded to the inside. The pin that secures to the pedestal here is also welded. And as for the cradle itself, again, it's just one piece of steel that's bent to this shape. And this section here is just welded in place. And yet this was able to facilitate the exact same job as all of the other complexities that I touched upon before. One other thing I need to mention is that while on the other unit, the can rail holder mechanism is stamped and it's bolted on, on this system here, it's actually welded permanently in place and it's not changeable. On the back, the travel lock system is again a steel bracket that has been welded to shape. Compared between the two, this unit here is much easier to put together and is arguably more efficient, which is why if you look at modern M2HB system holders, they tend to follow this type of format with the use of stampings. However, although this system here is the more economical and efficient way to go about it, this unit here does have an advantage that isn't found on this variant, and that has to do with the shape and with the composition of this section here of the cradle. If you notice, there is this large oblong lump found in this area over here. The reason why it has this large descend down to it is that this acts as the travel lock pin holder, like I touched upon on this one over here, but it has the added benefit of giving extra mass to this area. And why this is important is that when you're swinging the the M2 around, namely when you're elevating it, the receiver is very, very heavy, specifically in the rear section over here. And the added mass found on this area here, the cradle, gives it a counterbalance type effect and it'll help keep or make lowering the gun a bit easier compared to without it. This is one advantage that this system has that is just not present on the stamped sheet metal counterpart. As for which setup is better, that's really hard to say. I guess that really depends on personal taste as well as also what do you want to use the unit for. I will say, however, that the sheet metal pattern was more than capable for anti-aircraft use because there was a adaptation of this exact same design that was really more or less used for anti-aircraft rolls where it had a lot of high angle usage. So obviously the sheet metal one here was more than capable of the task at hand. But again, both of these units that we see here on the table were utilized in this type of configuration during World War II. While I have both examples on the table, I might also touch upon briefly about the paint. Like I said before during the painting portion of the video, you do have two options on painting M2s. This one here is painted in flat black, while this one here is painted with the dark gray primer. Both colors are correct for both not only wartime M2s, but also post-World War II M2s as well. Another thing I want to touch on with the paintwork involves the grips found on the charging handle as well as also the spade grips themselves. You had a lot of different materials that were used for this application during the course of production for the M2 and the same is also true today. Some of the grips were wood, some of them were Bakelite, and then later on you would have seen grips made out of black polymer. One thing that I hazard against is trying to replicate wood I always found that if you want to replicate wood, the best way to do that is to use real wood. And on my models here, to do that, that would require really extra work, where I would have to cut these sections off and make new ones on the lathe and put them in place and stain them, do all that stuff. It is doable, but frankly, I just like to use my weapons to have the look of Bakelite in their place. For Bakelite, you simply just paint the units and you're basically good to go. On this one over here, I went with Tamiya Hull Red, while this one here, I went with Tamiya Red Brown. Either which is more than accurate for the look that I'm trying to achieve because these grips came in a multitude of different colors. Another color that I have seen and is one that I've used on a number of my builds is Black Bakelite, as well as also later on, this would be swapped over to Black Polymer. The black polymer or bakelite that's simply to me a flat black or gloss black and if you're going to go with the flat black approach you just wipe down the sections with a gloss lacquer like i touched upon earlier in this video 
All three options will give you some really good results. And again, as for which one to use, this boils down to your personal choice. Another thing to contemplate is also trying to make the charging handle here a different color compared to the spade grips because again, this is something that is very, very frequently seen. One other thing I want to mention involves the carry handle here on the barrel. One thing that a lot of people don't understand or realize is that the carry handle is not found in one particular spot. If you look at most models that are on the market in a multitude of different scales, they tend to have the carry handle molded dead center here on the bottom, and, and this is more or less done for molding reasons. But in actuality, the carry handles were very, very flexible, and they can have a multitude of different ways they can be found on the barrel. First, the carry handle cage setup itself, you have these two slots that are found integrally turned into the barrel turning. And with the way the carry handle system is, it's just like a bent piece of wire with two prongs on it, and it snaps and clips into those two sections that are found on the heavy barrel. This portion here in the center that's perforated is more or less a heat shield, and again, that just snaps into place. The other thing I want to mention is with the, these two sections that we have over here, the carry handle is actually separate from them, and because of that, it can it's hinged and can also move around. So, with this in mind, the carry handle can actually spin a com completely around the barrel, and the carry handle itself can also flop around in a multitude of different ways. So when you're modeling the carry handle, you have a few options available to you. On my models, I tend to have the carry handles rendered in a manner that's off-center, like you see here, but you can also have it rendered with the carry handle jutting out from the side, or you don't really want to have it going straight up and down as it gets in the way of the sights, but when the carry handle is in that position, you tend to see it knocked to the side of one way or another, and there are many photographs of really M2HBs in service in that type of position. So again, it's something else to, for the modeler to think about to add a little bit more extra life to their builds. In the end, I'm really happy in how everything turned out. The setup that we have here went together basically problem-free, and with the way the model is in this configuration, it's going to be a perfect addition to my collection. Outside of my personal collection, the addition of this cradle to the marketplace is something else that's really beneficial, as it's always a good thing when the consumer has more options available to them. Not just with the set that we have here, but also with the other set that I touched upon in the other video. This gives the builder a way to add a little bit more differentiation to their models in their collection. With these setups, you could mount either the M2HB or also an M1919 to any vehicle of your choice, be it a truck, a Jeep, or possibly even a tank. All of which can be done with either of these mounts that we have here. If you have a lot of U.S. military vehicles in your 1.6 scale motor pool and are looking to add some variation to them, one real easy way to break up that monotony of having every single model, having every single 50 or 30 mounted on every single cradle in the same format, the addition of either of these sets over here is a great way to change that. Both of these cradles were used to great extent during World War II, and they were used extensively post-World War II as well for many, many decades. And matter of fact, both of these sets are probably still used today in some place, in some way, shape, or form. Hopefully you walked away learning something new on how the M2 mounts to a vehicle of one flavor or another. And although most of this information is something more akin that you would see on the Forgotten Weapons channel, this is a topic that I always personally had a lot of interest in. The... Cradle systems are one of those things that aren't really thought too much about in the modeling world, but again, it's one of those small little subgenres that's a way to really enhance your models, and it's just one of those extra added flavor enhancers that you could add to your builds that really makes it stand out from the pack. And with that, that wraps up this product announcement video for this 1.6 scale East Coast Armory.com D90 045 50 caliber cradle mount. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posts of content, being new product announcement videos like this fellow over here, or the other model showcase videos and large scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop a new post of content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of this particular build, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that are frequently published on this channel. 
Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again, and I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then.